uh, there's one obvious point, so obvious it's embarrassing to mention it, but I'll mention it anyway. Uh, and that is, in the case of any uh, threat or use of violence, uh, there is a burden, the burden of proof has to be met by those who advocate it, obviously. Uh, that's true whether it's domestic violence or uh, violence in international affairs. And it's a very heavy burden. Uh, no one has to ever give an argument against the threat or use of violence. Uh, that's given. You're opposed to it, every sane person. Uh, so a strong argument has to be given for it. Uh, and it's not an argument to say, for example, uh, what else can I do? Uh, so, uh, you know, if someone's beating their wife and children and they say, what else can I do? That's not an argument. Uh, same in international affairs. Or to take the lead story in today's Toronto Star, uh, if we could talk to the people who carried out a attack on a kibbutz in Israel yesterday and uh, ask them, why are you doing it? They can't just say, what else can I do? That's not an argument. Uh, that I think that suffices to eliminate the arguments that are given for uh, the bombing of Iraq, but we could discuss that. In any event, one thing is clear. Uh, the burden of proof is on those who advocate violence or even the threat of violence, and it's a heavy burden. Uh, the um, Just one other comment, the basic issues were framed reasonably well on the uh, lead in the stories in the press today, so just to keep to that. Uh, there are two extreme positions uh, expressed, uh, one by the Bush administration, uh, Andrew Card this time, who reiterated the position that uh, the administration has been making extremely clear, no one should be deluded about it. Uh, he said something approximately like this, that uh, uh, we regard ourselves as having any authority we need to attack Iraq. Uh, the Security Council can meet and discuss it if they like, but that has uh, no particular interest to us. Uh, that's the position that has been made clear and explicit throughout. It was reiterated again this morning, yesterday's news conference. Uh, another position at the other extreme, which was reported in the Washington Post, Toronto Star picked it up, uh, uh, was the position of the Arab League, uh, which endorsed the UN resolution, claiming that they had explicit uh, guarantees from Colin Powell that it was not a that it was not a trigger for war. That is, that the White House position is false. Uh, you can make up what you like about that. Uh, and uh, interestingly, reiterating, uh, they, uh, according to the story, introducing, but in fact reiterating. Uh, a, a position which is rarely mentioned, uh, the Arab League statement called for uh, uh, regional disarmament, not just disarmament of Iraq. Uh, that was called a new proposal. It's not. Uh, that's part of uh, Resolution 687, the, resol the UN resolution that's appealed to constantly as authorizing war. Actually, it does, uh, doesn't do that, but it does call for disarmament of Iraq. Uh, and also calls for general moves towards general regional disarmament. That's Article 14, which is always omitted in the press coverage of this or the White House coverage. Uh, that goes back 10 years. Uh, that was the issue right before the first Gulf War. It's kind of more or less marginalized. But the issue, a major issue at that time, was whether uh, Iraqi withdrawal could take place from Kuwait, as Iraq had in fact proposed. Uh, within the framework of a regional conference on uh, general uh, problem, general regional problems of armaments, threats, and so on, which is all a code word for Israeli weapons of mass destruction. Uh, there apparently was such a proposal, was turned down by the United States, was not reported by the press. Uh, independently of that, uh, two thirds of the population in the United States supported it right before the bombing, not knowing that the proposal had been made and turned down. Uh, if they had known it had been made and turned down, probably it would have been a much higher percentage, and it would have been much harder to initiate that war. And it's possible that uh, withdrawal could have been achieved. Uh, uh, the State Department negotiators thought it was quite possible uh, without the devastation of war and all the horrors that followed. Uh, leaving plenty of problems, but uh, moving on to what is a very serious regional problem, namely the uh, capacity for uh, destruction and violence, which is there, 
and is recognized by the U.S. government. So, for example, the former head of the Strategic Air Command, a, st a strategic command, I mean, the major government body that deals with nuclear weapons, Lee General Lee Butler, uh, pointed out a couple of years ago that uh, the main problem of proliferation in the region uh, is uh, Israel's nuclear capacities, uh, which are far beyond anyone else's, uh, and are part of the U.S. system of uh, regional and global dominance. And Butler pointed out that as long as that exists, of course, it's contributing to proliferation and uh, violence and so on, and something has to be done about it. Uh, that's a reference, really, to the United States. Uh, these are so those are two opposite positions on what's happening and the uh, issues I think my feeling is ought to be framed in that context. Uh, maybe one question. Uh, so now, uh, so I am from the Swiss radio. I from Swiss radio and Swiss I'm radio. Italian speaking. So I try to yeah. express myself <laughs> okay. in English. And um, now everybody, or at least the uh, uh, US government, says that uh, what they want is to disarm Iraq. Uh, many people say that there is uh, other reasons, for instance, uh, uh, the volunteer of having a hand on the petrol there, or uh, maybe the volunteer of uh, take the attention of the United States away from in inner problems like Enron uh, economic problems. What is your, uh, what is your point of view? Of view about that. Well, um, I, I agree with the second position. It's, I think, in fact, close to truism. Uh, and it's expressed very clearly in uh, right in the mainstream. I mean, you don't have to go out to the fringe to find it. So, for example, uh, in last week's International Herald Tribune, uh, there was an uh, article by a senior uh, fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations, Yusuf Ibrahim, who's been the lead uh, Middle East correspondent for the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal for 30 years. You can hardly get more respectable than that. Uh, and he says exactly what you just said. He said there are two reasons for the war. Uh, one is uh, George Bush's, the, the administration's domestic political problems, which accounts for the timing. That's why it has to be now, not, say, next year. Uh, and the long-term one, long -term one is the fact that Iraq has the second largest oil reserves in the world. Uh, the United States has been obvious for a long time that the U.S. is going to do something to regain control of them. Uh, September 11th, I'm now going beyond his article, September 11th provided a pretext, as it applied a pretext for many other things, like the intensification of Russia's war in Chechnya and all sorts of other things. So it was a pretext to do all kinds of things. And the domestic political problems uh, explain the time very clearly. In fact, the uh, Republican campaign managers virtually say it. So the tactic worked brilliantly in the current, just past congressional elections. Uh, it was possible to, and uh, people's attention was turned away from the problems that really concern them very seriously, namely the assault that's being carried out against the general population by the current administration, which is not so concealed. Uh, but the attention was turned away from that to the fear of uh, the monster going to destroy us and uh, the brave cowboy who's going to save us. And that's going to be even more important uh, a year from now, which is why the war has to be now, not next year. Uh, that'll be the middle of a presidential campaign. And if you think about, say, Karl Rove, you know, Republican campaign manager, the last thing he wants people to think about uh, is the fact that uh, there are new tax cuts for the rich. Uh, you know, the country's being purposely sent into a big uh, fiscal crisis to cut back social spending. Uh, that's going to attack uh, the limited medical support system that exists. Uh, pensions will be uh, shaky if they'll even exist. Uh, those are uh, the environments being destroyed. I mean, that's not what you want people to think about when they're coming into an election. What you want them to think about is, uh, you know, praise for the magnificent leader who saved us from imminent destruction by, you know, Hitler, and is now marching on to some new triumph. Uh, this is classic. You know, this is, in fact, for the people now running the uh, Washington policy, it's second nature. This is simply a replay of what they did 20 years ago. It's pretty much the same people who were in the Reagan administration. Uh, well, in fact, you can read this in the lead story in this morning's Wall Street Journal, if you like, though they put it a bit obliquely. Uh, but what they point out, which is correct, 
uh, is that the current Bush administration, which is very, it's many of the same people who were in the Reagan administration, that did exactly what they did 20 years ago. They quickly drove the country into a big deficit by two number of factors, but the ones under their control were a tax cut for the rich, about 40 percent go to the top 1 percent, uh, and uh, uh, a, a, big, uh, a big government. Remember, this is a big government. Republicans are in favor of a very big government, uh, but a government for the rich. Uh, so uh, they increased government. In fact, the Wall Street Journal points out correctly that this was the biggest increase in uh, federal government spendings in 20 years. 20 years happens to be when they did it the first time. Uh, and now they're doing it again, and the purpose is quite clear. You'd be pretty blind not to see it. But you don't want people to be paying attention to that. It's okay if readers of the Wall Street Journal do, they're trustworthy, uh, but not the people who are going to vote. They shouldn't be paying attention to it. So yeah, the timing is, uh, it's, it's clear that you know, they have to drive the war very fast. It's got to be over before the presidential campaign starts, so then you're on to the next. And the long-term uh, interest is what Yusuf Ibrahim pointed out. That's the second largest oil reserves in the world. Uh, it, it's not a matter of access. The United States doesn't care about access to them. In fact, doesn't even tend to use them. It's a matter of control, which is something quite different. Uh, if you control oil resources, uh, first of all, you can guarantee that the enormous uh, uh, wealth that flows from them will go to the right people, like U.S. energy corporations and British energy corporations and the U.S. Treasury and the uh, you know, military industry, which will have contracts and so on and so forth. So it's that. And then it's uh, as commonly pointed out, the State Department pointed it out uh, 55 years ago, uh, it's a stupendous source of strategic power, quoting the State Department. Uh, and strategic power means world control. So it's not a matter of access. It's a matter of world domination uh, and ensuring uh, that the wealth uh, goes to the people who matter. Uh, and those things are important. Uh, so yeah, those are, I'm, I'm sure everything's correct. Yeah. Um, given that unanimous uh, resolution from the uh, UN Security Council, it, it, it pretty much seems like a foregone conclusion at this point that there is going to be a military strike on Iraq. Depends how you interpret I'm the resolution. I'm wondering what your view of that yeah. is. Well, there, 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 I mean, on paper, there was a unanimous resolution. In fact, there was not. Uh, there was a resolution supported by the U.S. and Britain and opposed by everybody else. Uh, that's, uh, that's exactly the split that I just mentioned. The wording of the resolution uh, does not give the U.S. any authorization to do anything, uh, but the Bush administration made it extremely clear, couldn't be clearer, before the resolution was passed, uh, right after it was passed, and again today, uh, that it interprets the resolution as giving it the right to do anything it wants. So to repeat, uh, the Security Council can just talk if they like, but uh, we have the right to do anything we want. Okay. Uh, I mean, you re really have to be dedicated to self-delusion not to see this. Uh, the, I mean, th there is some Actually, the front page story in the New York Times about it right before the uh, resolution was, as the resolution was being introduced, and it was accurate. It said something like this, uh, despite the diplomatic niceties, uh, the uh, uh, Washington is going to interpret the resolution as authorization to attack Iraq when it uh, chooses to do so. And that's accurate. The diplomatic niceties are there so that writers of editorials can talk about the wonders of diplomacy and multilateralism and so on. Uh, and the uh, commentators can uh, praise Colin Powell and do all these usual things. Uh, but the reality is exactly the way they described it. And since the administration is being very open and clear about it, uh, if one wants to be deluded, it's a choice. But uh, there's no reason to. Is there anything that average North Americans can do at this sure. point to thwart a military strike? To oppose it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's huge opposition. I mean, it's, it's in fact, it's completely without any historical precedent. Uh, there, are, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I've talked to any, I, I'm talking all the time. I can't, I haven't seen an audience of less than a couple of thousand people for a long time, and it's mostly about this now. 
Uh, and uh, there's huge demonstrations to prove this. Just ask yourself, uh, when has that ever happened? When in the entire history of European imperialism, counting the U.S. as part of Europe, in the entire history, when has there been massive opposition to a war before it began? It's never happened. And it's not just here. It's in uh, England, in Italy. There were a couple hundred thousand people the other day. Uh, this is new. It's never happened before. I mean, people mention Vietnam, but you know they forget what happened in Vietnam. And in Vietnam, the, the U.S. had been attacking South Vietnam quite publicly for four or five years. Practically, had destroyed the country before there was any protest. Yes. I was just wondering if you could offer some context on the sealing off of like a quarter to a third. I was wondering if you could offer some context for the sealing off of like a, a quarter to a third of Kuwait and the closure of the Al Jazeera office there. Well, the Al, Al Jazeera office has been a thorn in the side of uh, uh, all the governments of the region and all, also the United States uh, because it just reports independently. Uh, and they don't like that. Uh, when the emir of uh, um, Qatar was in uh, Washington um, right after 9-11, he got a dressing down by Colin Powell, uh, who demanded that he control and cut back uh, Al Jazeera, because it, it was just much too open and free. And he then gave a press conference in Washington, which as far as I'm aware, nobody attended, uh, in which he kind of ironically uh, informed the American press that there was such a thing as freedom of the press, and Qatar was going to protect it, uh, even if the U.S. State Department uh, was opposed. I didn't see much. Actually, it was reported in the Wall Street Journal. I didn't see it anywhere else. Uh, the, uh, and the, that continues. I mean, as, uh, uh, the, uh, as, as when the U.S. was bombing Afghanistan, uh, as it's, the Northern Alliance was moving into Kabul and the Taliban fled, uh, the last thing that the U.S. did before they, their own forces took over was to bomb the uh, Al Jazeera station in Kabul. Uh, there was a missile attack on it. They claimed it was an accident. Or, you know, they thought it was an arms depot or some story, but nobody believed that. Actually, I was in, uh, I was in Islamabad a couple of days later, and uh, took a huge press, massive press there. People were just laughing. Of the Al Jazeera people took it for granted that, of course, they were bombed, and the, and the reason was clear: they didn't want filming of what was going to happen. Uh, Al Jazeera, well, you can think what you like about it, but it's very open. I mean, it has everyone from um, you know high Israeli officials to um, you know, radical Islamists. I should just uh, to be honest, they've even interviewed me a couple of times. <laughs> you know, so they're pretty far out, <laughs> but uh, they just have lots of things, and it's been a it's been an eye opener in the Arab world, and everybody tunes into it from all over. The uh, you know, the governments hate it, of course, and keep trying to close it down, uh, and the U.S. government hates it too. So yeah, they want to get it out of Kuwait, uh, opening up areas of Kuwait to. Uh, well, that's just part of the preparation for war. I mean, it's worth remembering that uh, even Kuwait is opposed to the war. I mean, in fact, there's no one in the region who uh, can be found who's in favor of the war outside of Israel. Uh, there's strong opposition, even from Kuwait and Iran, uh, both of which were invaded by Saddam Hussein when he was a U.S. ally, incidentally. Uh, and, uh, of course, they hate Saddam Hussein. In fact, most people in the region despise him, but they don't fear him. Uh, because they know there isn't much you can do. Uh, the only people who are afraid of him are Ameri Amer uh, you know, in the United States uh, because they're terrorized by the propaganda. So, you know, George Bush tells them every day that if we don't do something now, you know, he's going to bomb us tomorrow. Uh, and it works, sort of. And the other people who are afraid of him are Iraqis. Uh, but that's not, uh, and they have good reason to be, but that has nothing to do with the war. They're going to be even worse off. They're even more opposed to the war for good reason. Uh, but the people in the region aren't afraid. I mean, they're afraid, but they're afraid of the United States, like most people in the world. Uh, they're not afraid of Saddam. They hate him, but they're not afraid of him. And there's perfectly good reasons. I mean, look, everyone wants him disarmed. But just even imagine, suppose he had nuclear weapons. What, what would he do with them? I mean, like, suppose I had nuclear weapons in my garage, say. Could I do anything with them? Well, there's no uh, nuclear weapons are of no use whatsoever unless people know you have them. Right? 
but if I have them in my garage and nobody knows about them, I can't use it as a threat, and I can't use it as a deterrent. As a deterrent right? You have to make it obvious that you have them. Well, the, the instant uh, Iraq indicates in the most marginal way that it might have weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, it's going to be obliterated. Okay, uh, and if you, you know the, 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 the you know, I, I'm take say the, you know the Rand Corporation or the Pentagon. I'm sure they have, I mean they have groups meeting on every imaginable contingency. Actually, they even have contingency plans to invade Canada. If you're interested, <laughs> they, they do. There's a good book on it. Uh, but so they yes they have contingency plans for anything. But I'll bet you they don't even have a committee dealing with the likelihood that uh, uh, Saddam Hussein will threaten anybody with weapons of mass destruction. It's outlandish. I mean, nobody wants him to have them, of course. But the minute he gave any indication of having them, it's suicide. Okay, if he wants to commit suicide, there are easier ways. He slit his throat. North Korea just recently announced that it was still pursuing nuclear capability. Why the lack of response by comparison to the U.S.'s dealings with Iraq? What, what would be the motivation for just sort of ultimately forgetting about it? It's out of the press now. Yeah, well, I think uh, the reasons are the ones that were suggested before and that I quoted Yusuf Ibrahim, but I can quote many others. Uh, North Korea does not have the second largest oil reserves in the world. and. Uh, a uh, conflict with North Korea wouldn't help at all for uh, political reasons. In fact, it would be a catastrophe. You know, uh, the uh, uh, first thing that would happen is North Korea would attack South Korea, and, you know, wipe out Seoul and uh, Japan. And who knows what would happen? So there's no political gain to be made by that. Uh, you said the, the fact that North Korea announced it is probably we don't have all the intelligence reports, but it's very likely that the U.S. knew about this for some time. And the question is why the U.S. decided to release the information now. Uh, and that you can debate. Uh, and what North Korea is up to, you can also speculate. The usual, cons the standard assumption in the region and among analysts is that, uh, and in South Korea and Japan as well, uh, is that North Korea is playing a kind of a desperate uh, game to try to uh, gain some uh, to use these threats as a negotiating card to get aid, which it desperately needs. It's facing starvation and destruction. And if we were sensible about this, we would follow the lead of South Korea. They're the ones who have the most involved. In, and their position is, uh, yeah, we have to use this for further uh, uh, diplomatic uh, efforts to try to resolve the problem. And it's a serious problem. I mean, if North Korea were to collapse, as it could, it would be a complete disaster for South Korea. I mean, they would suddenly, I mean, you know, integrating East Germany into West Germany was a serious problem. And this would be infinitely worse. I mean, it's a collapsed country. South Korea isn't that powerful. It'll probably drive South Korea into a vast uh, decline. I mean, you know, you can read about all of this in the Far Eastern Economic Review and the standard sources. But yeah, that's a. Uh, people, anybody sensible wants to somehow integrate North Korea into the world, Korea and the world system without causing a catastrophe, which won't be easy. Do you see any sort of um, the U.S. responding to any international pressure, um, say, being in the Canadian anti-war movement? Uh, it feels somewhat hopeless to sort of pressure the Canadian government to sort of to act uh, and try and influence the U.S. government because it seems that they're not really responding to international pressure at all. So, do you see any role of, say, the Canadian okay. government in influencing oh, the U.S. No at this point? It. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, how much of an influence you can debate? I mean, the, the point is there's a no, there's there's clear split among policy planners in Washington and the sort of penumbra of advisors that they have. I mean, they're all hawks and con uh, reactionaries. Uh, but there is a extremely, there's a narrow, ultra-reactionary, fanatic group of extremists who are very close to power in Washington, Rumsfeld, Pearl, Cheney, and the rest. And they're frightening the hawks. Uh, so the, uh, uh, you know, put aside, somebody's tape recorder went off. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, 
uh, the main sort of hardline uh, respected military analyst, uh, strategic analyst for the Gulf region uh, is Anthony Cordesman, writes all the major papers and so on. Uh, and uh, just recently, he, he warned Washington uh, not to, to avoid, to not to pay attention to what he called the neoconservative extremists uh, and silly armchair strategists and their crazy plans for, you know, reconstructing the whole region, uh, which people like him find frightening, as do many uh, right-wingers. Uh, and there is a split, uh, but uh, the, he's talking about people like Rumsfeld, Pearl, and Fife, Cheney, the ones who are really planning policy. And they not only have the world frightened, they have Hawks in Washington frightened. Uh, uh, and that, uh, and for good reason. Uh, the uh, uh, that's why you're getting people like Yusuf Ibrahim writing things like I just quoted, which is pretty unusual. Uh, the uh, and that uh, dis uh, 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 world opinion is going to have an effect on those, you know, how those forces play out. Uh, the more sane hardliners understand that the United States can't just run roughshod over the whole world because it, you know, has uh, approximately uh, you know, out. It's so overwhelming, has such overwhelming military power. Uh, the extremist elements, the radical extremists, uh, they scoff at it. They think we have overwhelming military force and we can just compel anybody to do anything we want. If they don't like it, you know, get lost. Uh, and that split exists and it's going to be influenced by public opinion and activism in the United States and in the world. And uh, these things interact. Like when people in the United States read about uh, 400,000 people in the streets in Italy, that spurs action in the United States and so on. It's an integrated world. So there's plenty that can be done. And whether it's enough, you know, we'll know in a couple of months. What I'm wondering, I mean, is it enough? I mean, is the U.S. war machine sort of an unstoppable force at this point? I don't think it's a, you know, I think it's a never lot of unstoppable. Are very, very concerned and, yeah, and they really, are. really quite depressed. They are. Yeah. I was in Europe a couple of weeks ago, and uh, people feel hopeless. Uh, they feel there's nothing you can do to stop the juggernaut. Well, they're wrong. You know, there's a lot that can be done. Somebody else's <laughs> tape recorder went off. Uh, the, uh, how, you know, uh, how this will play out, nobody knows. You never know. Uh, you can, if you look at historical precedents, it's gone every way you like. Uh, so uh, uh, take say the same people 20 years ago when they were coming in in the Reagan administration. It was very clear that they were trying to follow, uh, their, their main concern then was uh, uh, Central America. And they were trying to follow the course that was laid out by John F. Kennedy, who was their model uh, with regard to Vietnam. So they went through exactly the same steps. Uh, and the press went along as usual and so on. Uh, but uh, there was an unanticipated popular reaction in the United States and they had to back off. So they didn't invade Nicaragua directly. There were no B-52s. There were hundreds of thousands of American troops rampaging around Central America. Uh, they resorted to massive terrorist atrocities which practically wiped the place out. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as bad as B-52s and uh, uh, you know, the, the troops running around, and they just had to back off because of public opinion. Or if you go back, uh, well, you may recall the German justice minister was uh, fired a couple of weeks ago because of saying some obviously true things, uh, which are impolite. Uh, she uh, suggested, she pointed out that Germany in its own history has some recollection of uh, the uh, how unscrupulous leaders uh, were able to uh, frighten a very civilized population into hysterical fanaticism with uh, consequences we we'll have to talk about. Uh, but one of the things that she didn't discuss and which is worth thinking about is that the Nazi leadership didn't trust their own population. Uh, there was too much internal disorder and dissent. So they had to fight what was called, what nowadays is called a guns and butter war. They had to pacify the population by giving them crumbs while trying to fight a war, uh, which is very much what Lyndon Johnson had to do in the late 60s, guns and butter war. And just as in the case of Vietnam, it harmed the war effort. 
uh, the allied powers, Britain and the United States, uh, where they trusted their populations, were able to become virtually totalitarian during the Second World War. There was a national mobilization, you know, everybody participated, you didn't have to worry about buying washing machines and so on and so forth, because people just eagerly participated. So the democracies were able to become far more totalitarian than the totalitarian states, and that gave them an advantage in fighting the war. The, uh, and the Nazi economic czar, Albert Speer, in his uh, autobiography, his memoirs, uh, claims probably plausibly that this probably set the German war effort back by about a year, which could well have been the difference between victory and defeat. Uh, remember, toward the end of the Germany was way more technologically advanced than the Allies. Uh, it was mostly just Russian massive force that was defeating them, uh, and uh, they beat the V2s were coming along. Uh, they in another year they might have been able to hit New York, uh, and who, nobody knows what would have happened. So yeah, even the most extreme you know mass murderers and killers have to pay attention to their own to public opinion. They can't ignore it. And that goes all the way back through history, so it's nothing's hopeless. When you say that there is a lot that can be done, uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why, for instance, here in Hamilton, people have just been clamoring to get tickets to, to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. I think they, they, what they're hoping for are some solid, concrete suggestions. No, there are none. They're <laughs> going to be disappointed. <laughs> the only concrete suggestions are what everybody knows and has known for a long time. The thing is to do it. Okay. I mean, we all know how to protest and, uh, uh, you know, dissent and organize and educate and so on. These are things that everybody knows. The hard thing is to do something about it. Uh, so there's no, there, th if there were any magic keys about how to proceed, uh, somebody would have told us a couple hundred years ago. Uh, but whatever you're interested in, whether it's getting rid of slavery or women's rights or saving the environment or stopping a war and so on, uh, the ways of doing it are perfectly well known. Uh, what's, it's a matter of will, not uh, knowledge. They want the war to be over by the time the presidential campaign starts and on to the next. Okay, and that's in the works. So, uh, well, you know, roughly, uh, I mean, Israel is, a milita is, is not an independent country anymore. It's a, basically an offshore military base of the U.S. And as such, even though it's a small country, it's a very powerful military force. So according to IDF analysts, Israeli army analysts, its uh, air and naval forces are larger and technologically more advanced than any NATO power outside the United States. And uh, over 10% of them are permanently based in eastern Turkey, big U.S. bases there, and they're flying at, at the Iranian border. I mean, they don't care much about Iraq. They figure it's kind of a pushover, but they are very concerned about Iran. Uh, and there are probably plans in the works, uh, some scholarly literature on this, uh, to try to go on to dismember Iran and then reorganize the whole region. In fact, some of them are in public. Actually, that's what Cordesman was referring to, these long-term plans, which are semi-public, uh, which are scaring the hawks. But the other, and so I think the idea is to uh, have a, a, a build-up Saddam Hussein as some foe of monstrous proportions have a miraculous victory, you know, in which we were saved by the courage of the cowboy, and then we all huddle in fear and praise our leader and go on to the next. Uh, the German justice minister was exactly correct in describing the model. That worked very well in Germany. I mean, as long as Hitler was winning victories, easy victories, he was the most popular leader in German history. Uh, uh, and the Germany is, is, you know, it's not uh, the Taliban. And this was the most, uh, this was the center of Western civilization, you know, the most advanced culture in the world, the science, arts, literature, everything, peak of Western civilization. And it turned out not to be that hard to uh, drive people into uh, terror uh, that they were, that uh, Western civilization, meaning Aryan civilization, was under attack by the Jews and they had to fight a war of self-defense to protect <coughs> themselves from this monstrous peril. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they did, and as long as there were easy victories, it was very popular, especially when the population was being paid off with the crumb. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an extreme case of the model, but it's a familiar model. And I'm sure that they're thinking of what went wrong in 1991, 92, when they didn't do it properly. So in fact, remember what they did then. Uh, after the war in uh, Iraq, which I, in my opinion, was avoidable, but we go into that. Uh, but anyway, after the war, uh, there was a uh, popular uprising in southern Iraq. Uh, which might very well have overthrown Saddam Hussein, had re rebelling Iraqi generals and so on. And uh, Colin Powell uh, and uh, George Bush the first uh, decided to let Saddam crush it. Okay, so uh, um, for reasons that were not pretty well discussed, uh, and that led a pretty left a pretty ugly case. So it wasn't just that uh, you know the end of the war, uh, but Saddam was in place. He just crushed a rebellion with U.S. support. Uh, didn't look to didn't look like a magnificent victory. Uh, then the economic problems came along, and they lost the election. Well, that's why you know the U.S. is putting tremendous. Let's take Canada. The U.S. is putting a lot of pressure on Canada to increase what's called defense spending. Uh, defense means offense. That's standard. So they want Canada to increase uh, military spending for offensive purposes. Uh, part of the reason is exactly what you say. Uh, after the U.S. wins the war in Iraq, it wants countries like Canada to come in and run the country, okay, militarily. Uh, it's called peacekeeping, uh, and make sure that it works the right way. You know, like the U.S. will maintain control of the oil resources and the uh, the wealth will flow in the right place, and Canada will pay the costs. That's the role of Canada in the international system. Uh, not just Canada, you know, others will be enlisted for the same purpose. And they want to make sure that uh, some kind of government will be there, which will have some kind of facade of democracy. So it'll probably have a parliament, a prime minister, and so on. But it'll be a military-run government under the control of uh, Western power, meaning U.S. power, with the uh, you know, the kind of uh, the client states like Canada and others uh, doing the dirty work. Uh, that's probably the plan. 